Welcome and shalom, everyone. I love hearing from those of you who do take the time to email or contact me once in a while with encouragement. And so let me start by saying thank you to those of you who do that. And I hope you won't just read the uh, transcript on the sharing I do today, but we'll hear the audio as well. I'm going to be speaking my heart. I feel it very heavily in my heart, very strongly, even more than usual in my sermons. I'm asking a question today. It will cause some of you, initially at least, to squirm and make you feel initially uncomfortable. But many of you will be saying, it's about time someone mentions it. So I'm sure most of us have experienced great miracles, answered prayer. We know there's a God in heaven. We have no doubt about that. There are times we know Almighty Yahweh has miraculously stepped in our lives and protected us, helped us, intervened. We've all experienced those times, and we love those times. We will never deny those times or forget them. But now, now the tough question. Have you ever felt disappointed with Yahweh, with our dear Heavenly Father, with Almighty God? Certainly when everything is going well, you might wonder how anyone could possibly be disappointed with God. It even sounds dangerous, maybe even blasphemous to voice the question, doesn't it? How dare you even ask the question, have you been disappointed with God, you might ask. But I ask again, whether you've been ever admitted it or not to anyone out loud, have you ever wondered where God was in a particular trial or hardship. Why is this going on and on and on and on and on? Why are you not answering our prayers? We realize sometimes the answer is no or not yet. But why aren't you answering our prayers? And the prayers of so many others we know are praying about this. What's taking you so long, Abba, to answer? Have you not ever cried out, at least in your thoughts, Where are you, Father? I need you, I beg you, I pray to you, I petition. But why don't you respond? You have all power to do anything, absolutely anything, Father. And sometimes I wonder why you seem to remain silent or why you didn't act or don't act to prevent certain things or stop certain trials that are just so, so tough. Have you never felt those questions? Okay, are you willing to accept you've had those thoughts like that or prayers like that? Are you willing to admit that sometimes you wonder why Yahweh isn't doing more for you and his other children? And if you think I'm overstepping my bounds, did you realize that many of the prophets, David and Moses and Elijah, and many of them, Habakkuk, Zechariah, express these very same concerns, these very same sentiments, doubts and thoughts. And if so, if you've realized that, I'll show you some cases, how they climbed out of those depths of despair and depression when it seemed that Abba, when Almighty God was not uh, doing as much as they had hoped and that they realized he could be doing. Here's my point. Yahweh can do anything. He can work out the things we pray about and then, not uncommonly, the person we are praying for just gets worse and worse and eventually dies. God could have healed that person. God could have prevented that accident. God could have, could have, we say should have, made the ending a lot better. Yahweh could have kept that lightning strike from hitting your home. And in your lower moments, you even wonder if that was truly a sign, an act of God, as the insurance folks would call it. Was he trying to punish you? And sometimes he is, frankly. Or grab your attention. Sometimes he is. But sometimes that's not the point. Sometimes it's something else. Even you children hearing this, think for a second. Your lovely pet dog has an accident and loses an eye. Are you not disappointed? Could God not have kept that from happening? Or your pet budgie flies out the door never to return. Or worse yet, I guess what I experienced as a teenager, seeing your, my beloved cat running out of my 
beloved bedroom door with my beloved parakeet in her mouth. A bird, you know, parakeet, like a budgie. Or perhaps your kids, and I'm wondering, well, whoa, and the parakeet died, by the way, and I almost killed a cat. Or perhaps your kids studied and studied in school for the big exam and even prayed about it, hoping Abba would help you. And that, But the teacher asked all the questions on the chapter you didn't really read or study because you hadn't even covered in school. But she had told you to cover that, you know, to make sure you cover that chapter, you know, like two months ago. Hasn't that ever happened? And so you're wondering, Father in heaven, why? Why could you not have put that in my mind to study that chapter too? So even kids can go through this version of this topic. And so then what happens? Depression sets in. Haven't most of you experienced the feeling of feeling let down, being disappointed with God himself? Maybe you've never voiced it. Maybe you were afraid to voice it. But surely you've had those thoughts from time to time that God could have done more. With all the power that Yahweh has, surely he could have done more. One lady even said, I'm quoting roughly what she said. Well, first of all, I remember a lady back in Canada holding a 12-year-old daughter of hers who was dying, I think it was of leukemia, in her mommy's arms and The child is crying in pain, blood flowing from her eyes and ears, as I recall it. And later on, she says, how could a loving father truly just stand by, assuring us he'll never leave us nor forsake us? No, never, ever, never, never, never would I. That's Hebrews, right? But essentially, apparently doing little or nothing, while my little girl suffers and suffers and finally dies in my very arms, even as we're all praying our hearts out for him and for God to intervene, I mean, for her and for God to intervene, how could an almighty loving Father in heaven let that happen when he had the power to stop it? How could he have let that happen? I was asked that question. At that moment, I don't think, personally, Romans 8.28 is the verse to use. Not at that moment. That will come in later. But not at that moment. There is a purpose for everything that happens. I truly believe that. And we're going to talk about some of those reasons and purposes as we get to the last half of the sermon today. I hope it will mean something to you. And I hope you'll give some feedback to me afterwards about what you thought of the points covered in this sermon And if you have some things you want to add, I'm hoping this will become a key talk for some of you. Why am I giving this sermon? I thought of this topic, frankly, (laughs) and it's relatively not that big of a deal compared to other things that even we've been through. But I thought of this topic because I was it was something that I was struggling with earlier last week. July 6, Monday night, our house, 2015, our house was hit by lightning. And it knocked out our power, our air conditioning, our phone lines. We had no water for two or three days. Our TV and Internet was blown out. Our irrigation sprinkler system was shot to smithereens, and the sprinkler wiring still is a mess. Our invisible fence that we had for the dog is fried. I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know how much insurance is going to pay. We have insurance. We still have that deductible. And this comes on the heels of a horrible month of June of income. And the real cost was not being able to work for a few days. And the stress, the hassle, no water, no phones, the adjusters coming around, the phone calls we finally did have to make with our cell phones. It was kind of a, on top of everything else, it's been a rough two years, rough three years, frankly. Um, And, and, on top of everything else, it just felt like a final last straw. And in disappointment, Monday night and Tuesday night, I actually said the words, and I confess them to you, in prayer. Father, really? Really? Were you watching over us? And yet you allowed the Lightning to strike our house? Where were you, Abba, in all of this? We didn't have the money for even the $1,000 deductible. We just don't, didn't. 
and don't. And let me give voice to what I know is the thinking of many believers at various difficult times in their lives when serious trials have come to their lives. We prayed and we prayed, but nothing seems to get better. And we read about all the miracles of the Bible and the parting of the Red Sea and the manna from heaven and the fire from heaven with Elijah's day. And, and just we just want Abba to show himself strong for us. Sometime for you and for me in this trial we're having, Am I not voicing with some of you feeling? It was only when my thinking began to change. Sometime Wednesday, a couple days later, and I began to praise God in and for this trial. This lightning strike. Even though I still couldn't understand why it had to be us in our house. Even though I still didn't see how the money was going to show up to pay for the things. And uh, I don't even know if the insurance company will pay for the parts, you know, and everything. Be uh, We're still going through that. But anyway, the things began to turn around in a, in a dramatic way, but not until I began to say, okay, I don't understand it, but I'm still going to thank you. I'm still going to praise you in this, even though I don't understand it. And instead of bemoaning the lightning strike, God himself led me to the thoughts of thanking him for mercifully sparing my beloved wife, who was just feet from the impact point. From sparing our house, I saw on the news how some houses around us had burned to the ground. Not with that same storm, but I'm saying other storms. I praise God for sparing our house from greater damage than we had, which really wasn't that much compared to what could have been and what I've seen on other homes. And then some dramatic blessings began to happen, and dramatically, but only when I began to turn my disappointment to trust and to praise, even in, even for the trial, even though I didn't understand it yet. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just saying disappointment has filled my life often, especially in the past three years. And perhaps I was trying to get my attention, that even in these dark times, look to me. Look to me. He's, try he's saying, He's trying to tell me something so I can share it with all of you. Because frankly, let me let me make sure we all understand this. Some very, very tough times are coming ahead of God's people. Very tough times. They're on the way. They're starting. The, the stage is being set. And we have to be learning now how to cope with very tough times. Some of you believe that all believers are going to be raptured up to heaven pre-tribulation. And that's not what the book of Daniel says. That's not what the book of Revelation says. That's not what even Yeshua said. After the great tribulation, he says, you shall look up and see, um, you know, the, the elect being gathered and so on. He says that in Matthew 24, but that's a different topic. So anyway, we've got to be getting ready. So let's cover what causes disappointment with God. And did people in the Bible ever express that kind of disappointment I've been talking about? And worse, much stronger even. And why do we go through all this? And why doesn't God just seem to do more than we know? We know he can do more. Why doesn't he do more? How should we handle the disappointment? How do we come out of it? I'm going to talk about that today, as, long as, much, as much as I have time for in this sermon. How do we come out of it? I do know this, that Abba has to test our faithfulness to him. He has to test our faithfulness to him. Some very tough times are coming ahead for us. Daniel 7, verses 18 to 21, talks about a beast power that makes war against the saints and shall prevail against them until the Ancient of Days comes in their behalf. He has to test whether we will trust him at all times or not, even if there's terrible times ahead. It's easy to be upbeat. It's easy to praise him. It's easy to be happy. It's easy to be all smiles when everything is easy and calm. It's when things go haywire and trials are severe that we'll find ourselves much more on our knees as we submit to him and his will. You know, I gave a sermon last time on God's will. Be sure to hear that sermon, Living in the Will of God. So let's continue. What causes disappointment? What causes you to feel disappointed with God, with people or circumstances? What would you say? 
I believe disappointment is caused by something relatively simple. It's when our hopes, our dreams, and our expectations aren't met. Or our dreams and expectations aren't met when we hope they would be met or how they would be met. My wife and I have spoken at length about this, and that seems to be the cause of disappointment, when our expectations aren't being met. Either people let us down, or we let ourselves down, and there's disappointment, or we let others down, and we're disappointed with ourselves, again, or we let God down, and we feel disappointed with ourselves, or we feel God has let us down, or circumstances have let us down. All of those seem to lead us to be disappointed. And sometimes the disappointment, as I've said, is in the timing of things. Things didn't happen at all or too soon or too late for any good, or at least the way we see it. So we get disappointed when our hopes and expectations aren't met, or when we let ourselves down or feel God's let us down, or timing has let us down. So in a nutshell, that's what causes disappointments. But today I want to, I want to focus on that one where we said God let us down. We feel, when we feel disappointed with Yahweh, God most high. Why does that happen? How do we handle it? But there's something else here too. We get disappointed because we in our pride think we know what's best for us. And when God allows or sends something different, we're hurt. We're disappointed. In the last sermon I spoke about living in God's will. Even the Son of God, Yeshua, prayed, if, it's be, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Is there not any other way, if it be possible, but not my will, but yours be done? He prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Olive Press. That's what Gethsemane means. And sometimes we just frankly obsessed on our assessment that something happening or something that could just happened is either a good thing or a bad thing apart from any revelation from God himself. And we leave God out of the equation except that we become disappointed with him. And I've certainly experienced that for what he's allowed to happen or worse we think what he might yet even have sent into our lives. I've been through a lot and all of you have or many of you have. I've been through the death and the ill health of many of my loved ones. I've watched my son die. My parents have died. Death and ill health with my siblings. I've struggled with my own health diagnoses at times, including cancer and other issues. I struggle with a job earning enough to pay the bills, plus a lot of things I don't want to discuss publicly right now that are even worse. And it seems like life can become a series of one disappointment after another. But in all of that, we wonder out loud in prayer, Father, are you doing everything you really can do in our lives? Father, are you? Am I right? So where does Yahweh come in? How could we possibly be disappointed with an almighty Father? And yet simply because he is almighty, he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, and nothing he decides can happen outside his willingness to let happen. Nothing. So we're left wondering, why didn't he use some of that power and foreknowledge on my behalf when he could have? Right? We're left wondering, does life really have to be that hard when our heavenly daddy is king of the universe? <laughs> I'm sure you've felt that question. If you haven't, someday you might. Sometimes the disappointment with God is with timing, at least the way we see it. To us, God seems late sometimes. I'm sure Adam and Eve were very glad that Yahweh showed up and spoke to Cain about killing Abel. But humanly speaking, don't you think they were wondering, Yahweh, why couldn't you have shown up five minutes beforehand before Cain lost his temper and killed my son, my other son? And could he have? Sure he could have. But he chose not to. In his grand plan, he arrived perfectly at the right time. And the good guy died. And the bad guy lived. God allowed it. Why is life so full of those kinds of disappointments? Well, let's... Look at some examples in the Bible of some others who were disappointed with God, so you know that it's not just Philip Shields here. My spirit senses that some of you are very uncomfortable with the things I'm saying, so 
how could mere mortals speak of such disappointment with Yahweh? Well, many of you, many, uh, maybe some of the truly uh, strong ones who are hearing this have never been disappointed with God. My congratulations to you. Many Bible heroes, however, did voice these times of disappointment. But since the goal is to learn to absolutely trust Yahweh without a doubt, no matter what's happening in our lives, it's conceivable that some of you have arrived at that point already of total faith, absolute faith. No matter what's happening, you're good with it. You're okay. All's good. It's all good, you know. God is good all the time. It's all good. And no matter what happens to you, you have that joy in your heart at all times. And you've reached that point. And you've reached that point whether your son dies or your daughter. Now, if you've reached that point and you've never experienced a child dying in your arms, you've never experienced your house burning down, you've never experienced your house burning down after you lost your job and your child dying, you may yet have a little bit of ground there to to maybe feel some disappointment in an almighty being who could have stopped those things. But maybe you are at that point where you're perfectly satisfied 100% of the time, perfectly at peace with and content with whatever happens to you in life, and you never feel disappointed with God. There are some of you like that, I'm sure. And if you have had those severe trials I've just mentioned and still feel totally at peace and joyful and joyous, Wow, I would like to talk to you, and that is the goal. But I suggest you keep the sermon handy, because some, if some very serious things hit you, you might be thinking differently. I don't know. So here's some examples. Turn to John 11, a story you know very well. I'm going to say it quickly here for the notes' sake, and uh, the notes and scriptures will have it there. But turn to John 11, one of the central female characters in the life of Yeshua. That's Jesus. Uh, express some disappointment. I had a bunch of examples from the Bible. I had to cull them down to a few because there's so much to say about this topic in the Bible. In John 11, we have the fact that uh, Yeshua gets word that Lazarus is very sick and they would like him to come down from, I think he was in Galilee at the time, and uh, stop him from dying. So John 11, verses 5 to 7. Now, Yeshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Then in John 11, verse 17, I pick up the story. By now, the disciples know that Lazarus has died. So when Jesus came, when Yeshua came, John 11, 17, he found that he'd already been in the tomb. Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brothers. Now, Martha, as soon as she saw and heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Yeshua, Lord, Master, if you had been here, notice the tinge of disappointment in her voice, had to be there when you read these verses, Had you been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you? What took you so long? And then her faith comes back, and she has this awesome statement. But even now, this Martha, whom we sometimes disparage as the Martha, Martha, this incredible statement of faith right here in John 11, verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you, even now. And yet before that, she had said, what took you so long? I know if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Can you ever hear a painful tinge in that? Why did you take so long to get here? Haven't you asked that question sometimes? You could have kept Lazarus from dying, she's saying. Disappointment. Unfulfilled expectations. Surely Yeshua could have dropped everything, she thought. Surely he could have come down a little bit more. What's this two-day waiting thing that he waited two more days and all that? Then the time to travel down as well from from Galilee on, on foot. Thankfully, the story ended with Lazarus' resurrection and glory to God, as you know. But however, some many of us don't end up with that kind of ending. 
Many of us experience the premature death of, of our loved ones, of a son, of a daughter, or we go through, a, I have a dear friend in Canada who, whose son committed suicide. And I have relatives whose loved ones have committed suicide. And how painful that is to the living to go through that. I know ministers whose sons have committed suicide. And you wonder why. And we can recount one prophet after the other. Abraham. Abraham told Yahweh, you know what, I'm fine with Ishmael. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't need to provide someone else. Ishmael's fine. You're just in Genesis 17. Verses 15 to 18. Genesis 17, verses 15 to 18. But God wanted, uh, God had other plans. He wanted the, the son born to be one from a miracle, not from the works of man trying to figure out things for themselves. But Abraham loved Ishmael as well. How about Joseph? Do you think for a moment that Joseph, the son of Jacob and Israel, in other words, do you think that he never felt let down when Yahweh allowed his own brothers to sell him as a common slave, their own brother. Imagine how you would have felt your own brothers sell you as a common slave to a bunch of Ishmaelites. That's in Genesis 37. And when he was thrown into a rat-infested dungeon or prison, for obeying God's laws and not giving in to the seduction of Potiphar's wife. That's Genesis 39. He gets punished for it. Or when the chief butler forgot to remember Joseph and vouched for him in the courts of Pharaoh, after everything Joseph had done for him, that's Genesis 40, he languishes on in the prison. How long, O oh God? Right? Why did he have to go through all that? How would you have fared in those same circumstances? Then there's Moses. There were times Moses complained about the children of Israel, and other times he put his own life on the line in defending them. I often use the story in Numbers, I think it's 16. Um, when Yahweh actually tells Moses and Aaron, get away from these people, I am sending a plague through the rebels. But Moses and Aaron, Aaron ran right in the, into the people having the plague with a censor. I mean, it's incredible. But after everything Moses had gone through for Yahweh, how did his life end up? Not being able to see or go into at least the promised land. He saw it in a vision or whatever or to experience the joy of seeing the land firsthand, walking on it all the way up to the Naphtali and the uh, Valley of Jezreel and, and you know, the, the up, up, up there, uh, up, up in the north, uh, to see the coastlands, to see the area of Lebanon. And let's read what he says in Deuteronomy 3, verses 23 to 27. Uh, Moses had, as you turn there, Deuteronomy 3, Moses had earlier in Numbers 20 struck the rock when God had told him, this time don't strike the rock, speak to the rock. I gave a whole sermon on that, by the way. You can just look it up in the website. Uh, uh, type in strike the rock, and, and then, and then the, that sermon will pop up. <clears throat> God forbade him from entering the land. God took his life while Moses was still strong, he was 120, but it says he didn't have any weakness. He was strong. He's, you know. But anyway, that's in Deuteronomy 24, I mean 34. God, God uh, took his life away. But now let's read what Moses says about all that event in Deuteronomy 3, verses 23 to 27. After Yeshua, I mean, after Yahweh, I mean, had told him he was not going to be able to go into the Promised Land. Deuteronomy 3, verses 23 to 27. And then I pleaded, I pleaded with Yahweh, saying, Yahweh Elohim, Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what Elohim is there in heaven? What God, Elohim just means God. What Elohim is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? Elohim means gods, is actually plural. 
So it might be L there. What L in the Hebrew? Anyway, I pray, please, he says, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains, and Lebanon. But, I mean, Deuteronomy 3, verse 26. But Yahweh was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. And so Yahweh said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me about that on this matter. Can't you hear the plea from Moses? I'm, I repent. I'm really sorry. I, 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 I didn't mean to strike the rock again. Please let me go in. And Almighty God basically says, enough. Quiet. No more. Let's be honest with ourselves. You and I would have felt very disappointed. Do you really think Moses didn't struggle with that? In May 2014, I gave a sermon on that. Now, how about David? The Psalms are full of David expressing his wonder, his praise, but also his disappointments. I'll read a few. Let's start in Psalm 10. And in the last half, we'll also read more Psalms, I hope, on tips of handling these disappointments. David was quite bold in his complaints. So one point early on is voice your concerns, speak your heart, bring them to God. He tells us to cast all our cares upon him. A couple places in the Bible it says that. Psalm 10, verse 1, the Holman version says, Yahweh, why do you stand so far away? Or Lord, okay, Yahweh, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide in times of trouble? When I'm looking for you, why aren't you there? This is David saying this. Psalm 44, Psalm 44, verses 23 to 26. This is really bold. Psalm 44, 23 to 26. Awake, why do you sleep, Yahweh? Arise. Here's David saying to Almighty God, in my trouble, where are you? Wake up. Wake up, Yahweh. That's what he's saying. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? He goes on from there. Arise for our help, he says. In Psalm 27, turn over there real quick. Psalm 27, verses 8 to 10. Psalm 27, verses 8 to 10. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. Or your face, Yahweh, I will seek. And do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. Okay? You have been my help. Don't leave me now. Okay, don't forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then Yahweh will take care of me. So he ends up positively, but he begins by saying in Psalm 27, 8 to 10, don't hide your face. Please don't hide from us. Psalm 13, verses 1 and 2. How long, Yahweh, will you forget me forever? Psalm 13. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come around my neck. I sink in the mire. Do you ever feel like you're sinking in the mire? I am weary with my crying. Psalm 69 I'm reading. Verses 1 to 3. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. I'm crying out. Where are you? I wait for you. But did you know that in all of that, by the way, David's first psalm begins with the word blessed or happy. And David's last psalm, Psalm 150, begins with the word praise. He knew how to begin and end, at least. He, we, he, we end by praising God for how he has blessed us when it's all said and done. Let's move on. Job said, Job 3, he wishes he'd never been born. Jeremiah says the same thing several times. Jeremiah 15, Jeremiah 20. He says, I wish I'd never been born. Elijah just wanted to die. In fact, after Yahweh had worked with Jeremiah and yet allowed him to be so hated by the people and by the king and the, and the false prophets and so on, Jeremiah 15, 18 is an incredible verse of disappointment. By Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Jeremiah 15, verse 18. 
In the King James, it's even stronger. But where is my pain? Why is my pain perpetual? My wound incurable, which refuses to be healed. Why? Have you ever had a pain that refuses to be healed? And you say, why? Will you surely be to me, King James says, as a liar? Other translations say like an unreliable stream, or are you just a mirage as waters that fail? Wow. Here's Jeremiah saying, are you really going to be a liar to me after all what you've told me you would do for me and it's not happening? What am I doing here with all the trouble I'm going through? Jeremiah went through that as well. Okay, so the point of that section we just covered is this. It's normal. It's understandable if you feel disappointed that God didn't act in your behalf the way you had hoped. Okay? Now let's find some steps and answers, solutions out of the painful disappointments we feel. Fair enough? Okay, so what should we do when we feel disappointed with Yahweh? Besides understanding that Prophets of old, ministers themselves feel that way. By the way, did you know that uh, one of the professions with the highest suicide rates, probably in the top three, is the clergy? Counselors are also in the top three, psychiatrists and so on. One, at least I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I, I saw that. I haven't studied that recently, but I'm pretty sure I, I've seen that study. Anyway, number one, talk it out with God. Be open. Be like David. Be like Moses. Be like Elijah. Be like Jeremiah. Go ahead and speak your mind. God is big enough to cope with your complaints. Accept that it's not abnormal. It's okay to feel this way, in the beginning at least. You know, when Abraham had had that big victory against the kings in Genesis 14, God tells Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to greatly bless you. I'm going to reward you. And Abraham boldly says, in effect, how can you bless me when I don't even have a kid of my own yet? That's in Genesis 15, verses 1 and 2. How can you bless me when I don't even have a kid, a child of my own yet? And we've already read a lot of King David's pleas and prayers, and Job deplored his life and all of that. Our Abba is big enough to let you vent, okay? So go ahead and vent, but vent respectfully. Do vent. Jeremiah sure did, as I read to you. We're told in Psalm 55, verse 22, to cast your burden. Throw it at him. Cast your burden on Yahweh, and he shall sustain you. Cast your burden on Yahweh, and he shall sustain you. And when we do that, the next verse says, and he, and he shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You know, my own story, I was so frustrated I'd had such a terrible month of June, I'd had such a terrible three years, I'd had such a terrible previous year of test after test on health issues, but the good news was God healed most of those, dramatically healed most of those, so I had a lot to be thankful for, actually, but I'm saying going through it at the time, you know, you're, you're trying to be faithful and trusting and praising, but it's still... It still wears on you. The pain wears on you or issues or concerns and, and wondering about your wife and how she'll manage if something happens to you. And then we get hit by lightning. <laughs> I bared my soul to God. I realized, too, that it could have been a whole lot worse. And I did the same thing in 1982 when my son David died. When my son David died, a, a child of four months old, we had company that night, and we had put him down in the bed. My wife went to go check on him, and he was dead. He was already turning blue. He was already beginning to get stiff. And I heard the scream. It was so incredibly loud, so incredible. That for years, I couldn't hear anybody scream, not even children scream in delight or whatever without remembering that awful night. My wife went to the hospital with the dead child in the ambulance. 
I stayed back with the two girls that we had still. And I remember getting on my knees beside the bed and just saying, Father in heaven, you tell us to thank you and praise you in all things and for all things. And this is awful hard and I don't understand it. I'm going to obey you. Thank you. In this death, thank you for this death. But, you know, I still struggled over the days over over it. And it's tough. It really is tough. And, and I, I've talked it out with him a lot. The days when I'd sit by the gravestone of my child for three weeks. Now, that's what we have to understand. You can see the same story going happening with Elijah in 1 Kings 19. First of all, in chapter 18, 1 Kings 18, he had just had this incredible victory at Mount Carmel in northern part of Israel on the coast. I've been there. And 4,000 priests of Baal were killed. And then in chapter 19, after this incredible miracle and running ahead of uh, the chariot for many miles and the killing of the 400 priests of Baal, the fire from heaven, all of that, chapter 19, if you want to pick it up just briefly here, verses 1 to 18, and I don't have time to read it all here, but I'll, I'll put the, the scriptures in the notes, or you can look it up, First Kings 19, verses 1 to 18. The very next day, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he'd killed, executed all the prophets with the sword. Jezebel, wonderful lady, <laughs> not, sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the one like the ones of those you killed yesterday about this time tomorrow, about this time, about the, this time tomorrow. So when he saw that, saw the note, he arose and ran for his life. I mean, Almighty God in heaven, Yahweh, had protected him, had brought down fire from heaven, had had this powerful miracle. The other times when they were trying to arrest him, remember that he's called down fire from heaven and groups of 50 were being killed. And now a woman says, I'm going to kill you. And maybe just in its exhaustion from the events and the stresses of the day before, it's exhausting and must be terribly stressful to kill 400 prophets, which he did. And so perhaps his tank wasn't full very well. But anyway, he ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left. Now, now Beersheba is the south part of Judah, he ran all the way from Carmel or wherever he was running from all the way to Beersheba. That's a long ways. And he left his servant there. And then he himself went another day's journey into the wilderness of Judea, right in the desert, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, saying, it's enough. Now, Yahweh, take my life, for I'm no better than my father. Now, notice God's tenderness when you might think God would say, what is the matter with you? After everything I've done for you and shown you, why are you thinking like this? Why are you depressed? What on earth do you have to be depressed about? No, that's not what Yahweh did. You know, we read the verses about how Israel murmured and how God was so displeased with that that we're afraid to say anything sometimes. But here is Elijah saying, I wish I would just die. Have you not ever felt you could just die? I have. Have you never just felt that way? In the pain you're going through emotionally or physically or both? And then as he lay and slept there, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He hadn't eaten for a while. and He was tired. And the angel let him sleep and then he touched him. God touches us when we need it. And he looked and there was was a cake baked on the coals and so on, and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. Angel of God, the uh, angel of Yahweh came back. That could have been the one who became Yeshua. And says to him again and touches him again, arise and eat. 
So he arose, and this time he goes on a, on a trip all the way to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, 40 days and 40 nights to get to the, and we, we think that's in uh, what's now Saudi Arabia. And there, that's what Galatians says anyway. And there he went into a cave, maybe the same cave that Moses was in when, when Yahweh uh, revealed himself, at least his back, to Moses. He spent the night in the place, and behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, and the word said, okay, this is probably Yeshua, the word, right? The word was God, the word was with God, and the word became flesh. The word of Yahweh came to him, this was Yeshua, the one who became Yeshua, and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He says, I've been zealous for Yahweh Elohim of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, your Who's he talking to here? The word of Yahweh, your covenant. Now they, take, they want to take my life too, just like everybody else they've killed. And then all the things happen that you know about, the wind, the earthquake, the, and, and the fire. And God wasn't in any of those, but the still small voice. I'm in verse 13 now. And, and so what it was, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been zealous for you. They killed all your prophets. Now they want to kill me too. I just want to die. Okay, I added that I want to die a bit. But he said that earlier, right? My point is he's still depressed. And Yahweh says, Okay, I'm going to give you a job to do. Go anoint the king of Zion, verse 15, king of Hazael, uh, king of Syria, and then uh, Yehu, uh, make him king of Israel. And Elisha, uh, I want him to become the prophet in your place. So get get him ready. But besides that, hey, by the way, there's 7,000 Israelites who haven't bowed the knee to Baal or kissed him. 7,000. You're not the only one. Don't start thinking you're the only one. I often wonder, why did those 7,000 not let Elijah know they were around? Why weren't they encouraging him? Why weren't they talking to him? He didn't know about them, apparently. My point, though, is Yahweh gave Elijah some rest, some food. Uh, he touched him. He comforted him. He did not correct or humiliate him. But he gave him some space. He gave him some errands to do. So talk it out with God. We read no condemnation from Yahweh for Elijah's despondency his depression, his near suicidal thoughts, his apparent lack of faith the very day after he was full of faith, or his bad attitude. No, you don't get that. Yes, our spiritual state can shake, can be shaken. It can vary. It can be different one day from the next. Look at Elijah, man just like us. God knows that. He knows we're just frame uh, our frame is just dust so go talk to him about how you're feeling he can handle it he wants to handle it he wants to hear from you he wants to know how you're feeling number two first one is tell him talk to him second one let's be frank if we're honest with ourselves we have to admit that there are times we are so glad he didn't answer our prayers the way we had asked Years later, we can look back and say, I'm so glad for unanswered prayers. There's actually a country song that says that. God always answers prayers. So many times his answer is not yet or no. But those, he, an, those are still answers. And Paul had asked God three times to heal his thorn in the flesh, and God said no. And God had a reason for not answering. Sometimes he lets us in on the reason. Sometimes he doesn't in this life. You might have prayed and prayed for a particular girl, be your wife someday, and it didn't happen. And years later, you find out later what happened to her and are glad that God didn't answer that prayer, what kind of woman she turned out to be or whatever. Or, or, or a man, if you're talking about a, if a woman's talking about a, hoping she can marry some man. Then there are other times we may not be getting the answer if we want because God's working out something better. Something better. We get disappointed. Abraham wanted Ishmael. Oh, that Ishmael may live. Look it up in a concordance. It's there. Oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And we get disappointed. Uh, that's taking so long. God had told Abraham he's going to have a son. You know, 10, 15, 20 years go by and more before that happens. 
And from the time Abraham was called till the time he had a son was 25 years. And Yahweh finally got around to giving Abraham the promised son when Abraham was now a 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. So much so that Sarah had decided long before that that she would give her own maid, Hagar, Hagar or Hagar, into his bosom. Okay, into his bosom. It says that. Into your embrace. And she even says to Abraham, go into her that we might have a child by her. I mean, so taking her and giving her into his bosom. She's actually defining it right there in that very same chapter as I mean go have love, go make love to her. Now, into the bosom doesn't always mean that. But in that particular chapter, it sure does. You read the verses 3 and 5 and 7 and so on in Genesis. What chapter is that anyway? But it's, uh, it's, it's all there. It's all there. And then they got very disappointed when it didn't work out the way they had hoped. When God had a much better plan. Much better plan. But look at all the problems that happened because they tried to work it out their way and probably prayed that their way would work out. How many times are we praying, not thy will be done, but may your will be mine, may my will be yours, is what we often pray. We get it all backwards. But the point is, God's working something out. And sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to wait. In Hebrews 11.13, Hebrews 11.13 It says very clearly that these all died, all these prophets and great men and women of the Bible, they all died in in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them and embraced them. But they didn't actually yet receive the promises. And the end of Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40, all of these, having obtained a good report uh, or, or testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God something, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. God has something else in mind a lot of times when we don't get the answered prayer that we want. And remember that even his own son, who prayed, if it be possible, may, may, uh, uh, what he say, may, you know, may, may, uh, uh, this cup passed from me, but not my will, but yours be done. You know, that was his prayer. That was his prayer, wasn't it? Excuse me, just a second. I've got to find something here. Um, just a second here. But anyway, so so we've got to learn this, this bit of being patient because um, it's just something that I think we, we, we just never, never pick up on enough. Okay, point number three. Uh, so point number two is uh, sometimes we're glad God didn't answer all our prayers. Point number three, God never promised us an easy life. God never promised us an easy life. Excuse me just a second. I've got to print a couple things. Okay, here we go. No scripture says that we'll never have any suffering, right? In fact, it says the the righteous will suffer persecution. Uh, Scriptures are abounding there. They talk about the way of life, the the way to life is narrow and difficult. It's straight, straight meaning difficult. Broad and easy is the road that leads to destruction. Lots of verses that talk about that. So that's what life is all about. Uh, Getting us to surrender ourselves and submit to the fact that Yahweh's way is not going to be easy. And he tells us, you know, that there's no uh, truth in advertising. You know, I mean, there is truth in advertising with God. He tells us it's not going to be easy. And you, I'm telling you up front that don't think it's all a charmed life. It's not. This, what life is truly about, is getting us to surrender ourselves, to submit to and accept God as our God, no matter what he sends into our life. All of life is about making Yeshua our Lord and our Master to trust and obey Him no matter what's going on in our life. To follow and submit to God in every aspect of our life all the time. That's where I stood corrected. And in my story about the lightning strike, you know, 
Monday night and Tuesday night, I was thinking, you know, really? Is that why? Why would you, it really? Did you really have to let that happen? And I was being very frank with him. By Wednesday night, I was saying, I'm sorry. What, what was I thinking, you know? You spared our lives. You spared our house from being burned down. No one got hurt. Okay, it's a little bit of money, but you were there. You were there. And I'm sorry I didn't pass the test a little better than I should have, was, was my prayer by Wednesday night. That's what life is all about. Turn to First Peter 1, verses 6 to 9. Are we fair-weather friends at, of God only? Or are we only there when things are going really great? Is that what it's all about? First Peter 1, verses 6 to 9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Okay, so he's saying you can have grieving for various trials and still greatly rejoice because we're seeing through and beyond those trials that the genuineness of your faith, that the genuineness of your faith being far more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having seen, not seen, you love, though now you don't see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he's saying it right here, that the genuineness of our faith has to be tested in fire, so that it may be found to praise, honor, and glory. The genuineness of our faith. That takes a lot of pain, frankly, folks. That takes a lot of testing. That takes a lot of fire. Then that silver is put through the fire and the dross is melted, is poured out of it. When that gold is put in the fire and all the, what is not gold is taken out of it. Okay? And, but keep in mind that he doesn't ever tempt us beyond that which we're able, it says in 1 Corinthians 10:13. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation or trial also give you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so number three, God has never promised us an easy life. Okay, keep that in mind. Point number four, before you ever even understand why all this is happening to you, trust, 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 thank Praise, trust, thank, praise, trust. We're to praise him and thank him in all things and for all things, even before we see the answer. I gave a whole sermon on that, praising and thanking God before we see the answer. So uh, I think it's a couple of years ago, but you can look it up. Ephesians five eighteen to 21, especially Ephesians five twenty, says, Give thanks always for all things. For all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks for all things. Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Now Paul was a remarkable man who was beaten with rods. Stoned and left for dead. Probably had concussions and broken bones and broken ribs and, and, and stripes and, and infections and things and shipwrecked, all the various things he lists that he went through. And he says, be anxious for nothing. In the same book, he says, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've learned to abound, and I've learned to have nothing, and I've learned to have much. I've learned to be at peace no matter what, what I'm in. So Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Let your request, like at point number one, be talking to God about it. Okay? Now this fourth point that I'm talking about is trust, thank, and praise in the trial and for the trial. Ephesians 5.20 says in it, I mean for it. And Philippians 4 verse 6 and 7 says in it. Okay, let your request be made known to God in the peace of God, which surpasses anything you can explain, will come upon you. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, through Yeshua the Messiah. So uh, read that sermon or hear that sermon I gave on praising God 
Yeah, I think it's one of the, my favorite ones. And as I began to do all that, I just started saying, thank you for the lightning strike. You have a purpose for it and in it, and I trust you. You know what you're doing, and I thank you for the strike. I don't know how I'm going to pay for things, but I thank you in the strike, for the strike, and I thank you that nobody got hurt, that the house was mostly spared. Thank you, thank you, praise you, even though I have no idea how we're going to pay for it all. Thank you, thank you. And after that prayer, I had my most productive week in many, many months in sales, even though I only could work two and a half days that week. And then the next week as well. When we praise and thank, even before we see the answers, our Abba is able to do so much more than we might have hoped for. David and Bathsheba, who would have thought that would have ever ended the way it did? They should have been stoned. If you followed the the law directly, uh, the man and the woman would have both been stoned. But who's going to stone the king, right? But I'm saying the law said they should have been stoned. But once God killed the illegitimately born son as a punishment for David, he understood that that was more serious punishment for a shepherd king than killing him himself. And David fasted seven days before the son died. And once he heard that the son of the adulterous union had died, David accepted it, and he went on to worship Yah, or Yahweh. That's in Second Samuel 12, verse 20. He didn't lay there wondering what on earth is going on, I don't understand, I'm so upset. No, it says he quit fasting at that point. He had something to eat, and then he went to the tabernacle, and worshipped. I think largely because of the way David handled it, God used the very next son, the illegitimate, the illegitimate son of that union with Bathsheba, now as a married couple, Solomon, Solomon, to be the very next king and the one in line for the messianic line. It's the only son of David where it's recorded in Second Samuel 12, verse 24, that Yahweh loved him. Yahweh loved him. In fact, Yahweh called Solomon Jedidiah, or Yedidiah, which means beloved of Yah. Yedid Yah, or something like that, probably in Hebrew. I don't know. I don't speak it, but, uh, but, but beloved of Yahweh because of Yahweh. Yahweh loved Solomon, and Solomon became, after David, the next in line for the Messianic line. Who would have ever, ever anticipated such a glorious ending to the David Bathsheba Uriah debacle. When we turn it over to God in praise and worship, things work out for good, like Romans 8.28 says. Point number five. It's point number four. You got that. Point number four. In the trial, for the trial. Even before you understand, start praising and thanking. Point number five. Ask for help in seeing the bigger spiritual purpose, the eternal unseen things that are of God, and pray that you're not, uh, if, you, if you're not shown the bigger purpose for your pain, that God helps you believe and trust that there is a, a bigger purpose. God sees the end from the beginning. Remember that. He sees the big picture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 9, and then 16 to 18, Paul says here, it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness. You know, in Genesis 1, 4, it says God divided the light, the light from the dark who has shown in our hearts to give us light of the knowledge of the glory of God. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So when we go through these particular things and come through it with shining, uh, you know, uh, with a shining performance, it's not us, it's God working in us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed. I'm reading 2 Corinthians 4, okay? Verses 6 to 9. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Skip to verse 16 now. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Okay? The inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more excellent and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction, 
which is but for a moment, is working for us a far greater glory, he says. Can you imagine that? Are you, are you, are you getting the picture, brethren, what he's saying here? Are we getting the picture? I'm turning the, something down on my speakers here. I might be getting a little too hot on the recording here. So, anyway, um, he says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen. Don't look at the lightning strike. Don't look at that dead son lying on the bed. Don't look at the pain that you're going through. We look at the things that are not seen, for the things which are not which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Isn't that an amazing verse, really? Father wants us trusting him and, and looking to him no matter what is going on. No matter what's going on. Turn now to 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. I really don't think God wants us fixating on this life. Our bodies are dust. They're mortal. 2 Corinthians 12, okay? And we've got to trust him no matter what's going on. Trials are there to help us overcome our weaknesses. In severe trials, we tend much more to go seek God and start praying more than we do in, in good times, don't we? 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. Paul had this thorn in the flesh. He says, three times I beseech God for it. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, in my pains, in my trials, okay? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That the power of Christ, of Yeshua, may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Am I there yet? No, brethren. Are you there yet? If you are, thank God. But that's the goal. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions. For when I'm weak, when I am weak, then I'm strong. When I am weak, I'm strong how? Through Yeshua making my weakness strong. And that's what happens in our trials. So Paul got to the point where he says, okay, pour it on. I'll accept that thorn in the flesh. I'll accept the trials. I'll accept the beatings. I'll, ac- I'll accept the stonings. Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. I'm God Almighty is the heavenly uh, weaver who's putting this beautiful tapestry together, and he's going to bring it all together. And he knows what he's doing. He knows what needs to come together to make this tapestry work that he wants to, to, to be. Now turn to Peter, First Peter 1, 3 to 9. First Peter 1, verses 3 to 9. Here's Peter. When he wrote the book of Peter, the body of believers were under hard trials. But look what he says in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ. This is what he's looking to. Not all the deaths and beatings and persecutions and jailings and beheadings and torture that they were going through. He's looking at the living hope of the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you, kept by the power of God through faith. That's my focus, he says. Yeah, I I could get down too, Peter could say. Paul could say. Jeremiah could say. But ultimately, all of these men and women of God, all of them, got to the point where they could say, my view is of eternity. And what God Almighty is preparing for me that's what I gotta look at. That's what you've got to look at. That's what we've gotta to learn to do so we're ready for the end times that are coming that are gonna be very, very tough. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials at the genuineness of your faith, which we read earlier. So, and then you can go from there and read Romans 8, brethren, that whole part there, which I don't have time to read, but you know it well, I'm sure. Romans 8, verses 18 to 39. If you haven't read that lately, please read it. Read it carefully. Romans 8, 18 to 39. And in 18, Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. i got to remember that when you're going through why is this prayer not being answered the way I want it to be answered? 
why is why don't I why didn't I get that better job? Why didn't I get that better house? Why didn't I get that get 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 right? God has something better for you, and He wants you to quit looking at this life so much. He wants you to look to the unseen, which you've been reading. Whole creation is in birth pangs till now. He says in verse twenty-two, we're all eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. And then he goes on in verse 20, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We don't even know how to pray. And then verse 28, all things work together for good to those who are the called and who love God. Until we're, because he foreknew us, he predestined us, he conformed us to the image of his son. He goes on and on. He says, who can separate us from the love of God? Okay, are we getting the point, brethren? Are we getting the point? Okay, he wants to freely give us all things. It goes on to say in verse 32, Romans 8, 32. And who shall bring a charge against God's elect? In verse 35, who's going to separate us from God's love? Who's going to make you want to leave it? Not a single thing, he says. Not a single thing can separate me from all the things God has promised to me. I'm not going to let a, a lightning strike. I'm not going to let the death of a son. I'm not going to let cancer. I'm not going to let pain in my back that just gets worse and worse. I'm not going to let any of these things make me give up my faith in Yahweh, is what Paul is saying. Verse 37, yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, or depth, or anything, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In all of these things, we're more than conquerors. And so I hope you're getting the point that, you know, a lot of times there's a point Yahweh's making. He's trying to get our attention. Or in the cases in the Bible, we read these stories, we say, why did God do that? Well, there's a lesson being being pointed out in, in some of those things. Like, God wanted Joseph in Egypt, frankly, to humble him probably first a lot. He was a spoiled favorite son. But also in Genesis 50, he said, God sent me here to save you all alive. The same way someday you'll understand why you or loved ones had to go through so much pain. Even for all the trouble that jo- Satan caused Job, the Bible actually says in Job 42:11, it says all the adversity Yahweh had brought upon him. Yahweh had brought upon him. God either allows something, causes it, or even sends it. Relax. He's bigger than we are. He knows what he's doing. He's got the big picture. He loves you with all of his might. He wants to do that for you. Point number six. With all that said, ask him to help you trust him. Because you're going to need to pray for that. Ask him to help you relax even when we don't understand the trial. Ask him to help you trust him. The just shall live by faith. That's what it's all about. The just shall live by faith. The frustrating part for us is trying to find meaning in what's happening when it hurts, when we're unable to cope, when it just doesn't seem fair, and it seems he could be doing so much more. Just like little children have to grow up to finally trust their mom and dad, so we have to learn to trust our dad in heaven, our heavenly father. We've got to. Absolutely got to. In James chapter 5, verses 10 to 11, my brothers, he says, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering, James 5.10. We count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seeing the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. We've got to have that faith that even though I don't understand it, I don't need to understand it except one thing, that I have a compassionate, loving God who's doing something that I don't understand right now, and he's not human. He is God, and he's wiser, bigger, and smarter, and more loving than I'll ever be. I trust him. We have to come to that point. In Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13, Judah was going to go into captivity and talk about a tough, tough, tough time they went through. 
The message Jeremiah brought them from Yahweh was Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. Almighty Yahweh speaking here, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says Yahweh. I know my thoughts. You might not believe it from what you're going through, he's saying. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You know what? Daniel read that 70 years later. And brought this before God. You will seek me and find me. I think that's in Daniel 9 that I'm thinking of. When he had that awesome prayer. So let's wrap up. I've got to trust him. So do you. No matter what. He can take all the time he wants. He's my loving father. I love him. I trust him. He can suffer. He can take my, he can cause me to suffer all he wants. Because he knows what I need. And he will be with me. And in my suffering, he will be made strong. He can take the life of my wife, my loved ones, my children, if he wants. I sure don't want it. But if he wants it, then I'll have to want it. Because he is God. He knows best. And I have to trust him. We don't need to understand all the reasons why he isn't moving more quickly to heal or to intervene. He probably is. Remember when Daniel prayed and it was three weeks before this angel got through to Daniel? He says, God sent me three weeks ago with the prince of Persia stopped me. Go back and read that. I think that's in Daniel 10, I think. Don't trust in your own understanding. Lean, don't trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. Too often we, we, we come before God. Why are you doing this? It would be so much better if you do it this way, God. And so here we are trying to advise Yahweh, the great, great, great creator, what we think is a better plan. And we're nuts, absolutely nuts when we do that. He is the master. He's the master potter. He knows the shape he wants his pot to be in that he's forming in you. Now, here's a hard statement to accept, but I think very true. When we're disappointed with God, it's because we didn't get our way. When we're disappointed with God, it's because we didn't get our way. Once I came to see that, it led to a profound repentance for saying to him two nights in a row earlier that I was disappointed with him, that he hadn't protected our home fully and completely. On Monday night, that's how I thought. Tuesday night, still a little depressed. Wednesday night, I was repenting in tears for questioning my Almighty Father. And blessings started to flow Thursday and Friday. We cannot, we must not lean to our own understanding. We're being taught to trust God. You can't be taught to trust unless you have some tests of that trust that you have to go through, that I have to go through, to absolutely put your hope, your life, your very life, the life of your loved ones, into his hands and never, never give up. From the bottom of my heart, I speak this sermon. Trust him. Praise him even in your pain. Thank him even for the horrors you're going through. Ask him to bless those who have cursed you. Thank him for those who have hated you. And then ask him to watch over them too, just as Yeshua orders us to do at the end of Matthew 5. For your heavenly Father sends rain upon the just and the unjust. Then also, that's what life's all about, getting us to surrender ourselves and believe that he has a will that he's working out. And in that will being worked out, I think it says that in Ephesians 1, around verse 10 or 11, somewhere in there, that he has a great plan. And when you see that plan working out, whether you understand it or not, you trust him and you back off and you say, praise you, praise you, praise you. In my weakness, I want you to be seen as strong. All of life is about making Yeshua our Lord and Master to trust, obey, follow him, and absolutely be there for him all the time. 
And that's where all this is headed. Not a time. I just pray that Yahweh will bless you and keep you and that we will all learn to live by faith all the time, no matter what's happening, even when at first we feel God is disappointing us because he really isn't. We love you, Father. We love you so much. Help us trust you. Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.